Hello, and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. Since just about the beginning of the pandemic, we've noted on this podcast that partisanship was shaping Americans' perception of risk and their behavior. Polls showed there were divisions over things like wearing masks and reopening businesses, and studies of mobile phone data confirmed that Republicans and Democrats were, to some extent, living their lives differently. A Pew survey of 14 countries last summer showed the U.S. to be the most politically divided of those 14 countries over its own handling of the coronavirus. Throughout this process, both Republicans and Democrats have accused each other of ignoring the science. Early on, President Trump's rejection of many mitigation efforts was seen as a reason that the U.S. was surpassing much of the rest of the world in COVID deaths per capita. Later, Democrats' reluctance to reopen schools didn't seem to jive with data showing that schools, especially for younger kids, were largely safe. The consequences of those policies are almost certainly not the same, but the way that partisanship forms our belief systems is likely similar. Today, we're going to dig into how partisanship has been shaping perceptions of the pandemic and decision-making more than a year on. And here with me to do that is Editor-in-Chief Nate Silver. Hey, Nate. Hey, everybody. Also here with us is senior science writer Maggie Kurth. Hey, Maggie. Hi. Also here with us is Emma Green, who covers religion, culture, and politics at The Atlantic. She recently wrote a piece titled The Liberals Who Won't Quit Lockdown. Thanks for joining us, Emma. Hey, it's great to be here. We've talked plenty on this podcast about Republicans underestimating the severity of the virus or sometimes rejecting things like masking indoors, especially towards the beginning of the coronavirus. But Emma, you wrote this week about how as the COVID science has developed and vaccines have become more widely available, some liberal parts of the country have appeared reluctant to adapt. What's going on? So the story started as observing from personal relationships, my community, people who I was corresponding with, sources, Twitter, that there was some segment of highly progressive communities where people were staying in a mode of lockdown that felt more like March of 2020 than March of 2021. Even though we've had vaccine rollout, very successful vaccine rollout, um, noticing behaviors that really hadn't caught up with the science. So I started to report this story trying to find both case studies to dig into where there have been conflicts over behaviors and policies in towns and cities, but also trying to get some of that data. And I found a really useful conversation with a political scientist I admire who studies this question of political identity named Mark Hetherington. Um, He's at UNC, and he has been doing some data catches throughout the pandemic on attitudes towards COVID. Um, And it just so happened that we had a kind of brain meld where he had been interested in some of these same questions and actually had um, some information, a survey that just came back, um, that looked at these divisions between not just Republicans and Democrats, but actually liberal and very liberal people, um, and definitely found that there was a significant distinction between people who call themselves very liberal um, compared to those who describe themselves as liberal and moderate, particularly when it came to anxiety about COVID and their perception of how bad it would be if they got a case of COVID. You know, this idea that If they get COVID, definitely it's going to be a catastrophic event versus potentially being a mild case. Yeah. Nate and Maggie, I want to bring you into the conversation a little bit. We got a lot more to dig into here, but you've all been tracking similar data and polls throughout the past year. I'm curious how you see partisanship as shaping pandemic decision making and behavior. I mean, I've I've definitely been paying attention to that data on how we perceive like the risks. Um, I was looking at the Brookings Institution uh, data that they had sort of on um, Republicans estimates and Democrats estimates, and then the actual share of like how much each age group makes up deaths from COVID. And I, one thing I think is interesting about this is that like when Democrats are over, like Democrats are overestimating this Republicans tend to like underestimate it. And when you look at something where you're estimating age group shares of the deaths, everybody's getting it wrong. (laughs) Um, And actually everybody overestimating for each except for the oldest group, which is just really interesting to me. And I think like what this has highlighted to me over the course of the year is just our understanding of risk is not very good. You know, like we just don't have a good innate sense of how worried we should be 
Um, I think that there's a lot of that there's a lot of people out there who sort of feel like there's really mixed messages and have kind of settled into estimating their risk based on what their friends, what their tribe estimates that risk as. Um, and that's, I think, where the partisanship kind of starts to come in. Yeah, I think it's an important point, right? It's pretty hard to like go through every single calculation. Like at one point I tried to actually calculate because I appear on TV and so forth. Like what's the risk of actually getting COVID from a haircut? right? <laughs> you know, you go through and you're like, oh, it's probably like one in 5,000 or something like that, right? And if I get COVID, I know my age group have a one in 500 chance of dying or whatever, right? You can't do that for like every decision that you make. So you rely on heuristics. You rely on kind of what your friends are doing. You rely on what kind of seems to be like socially acceptable, right? Um, and that's going to be affected by kind of who your peer group is, who your partisans are and so forth. Um, I mean, one thing I think we have to talk about that we'll get into later, I'm sure, is like there's both political identity and there's kind of like what media coverage you consume. Um, I'm not surprised to see that people underestimate how much COVID risk increases with age because the media, I think, actually tends to de-emphasize that. But people say, hey, even young people can get sick from COVID and die from COVID. Young people can get long covid and so forth, right? I mean, leaving long COVID aside, which is a big kind of potential game changer, depending on kind of what you think about that, your risk of dying from COVID if you're a healthy 21-year-old is very low. Um, and there are not that many people who are kind of willing to put it that way because they're afraid that that will encourage some 21-year-old to be like reckless or something like that. I mean, part of what's challenging too is like, um, for many people, the reason to be careful about coronavirus is more to protect society and other people in their orbit than to protect themselves, right? Um, and, you know, that's kind of like a noble lie that I think, like, <laughs> we kind of try to slip past people. We try to make it seem like, like, I don't think if you're thinking about the narrow self-interest of, like, a 20-year-old healthy, like, single woman or something, I don't think that person benefits from being socially isolated in a narrow sense, right? The reason why it might be good for society is because they can pass COVID on to someone else who might be older, immunocompromised, et cetera. There's a lot to unpack here. I'm curious, going back to this kind of segment that you were looking into, Emma, how big is this very liberal group that really seems to be ignoring the evidence or not changing behaviors as science evolves and vaccines are rolled out? Um, and, and what kind of effects is it having? It's kind of an amorphous category, right? Judgment about who is overly locked down relative to the science is a little bit in the eye of the beholder. Different people have different perceptions of what an appropriate risk is, even you know within the bounds of scientific evidence. Um, but you know, I did find pockets of it in a lot of different places. I focused on a case study in Somerville, Massachusetts, where there was a protracted and really pretty ugly battle over school reopening that dealt with some scientist moms who were super lefties. They love the Green New Deal. They love Black Lives Matter, um, but you know, ended up being really booed down for making the case that there were safe ways to get kids in person in school with some mitigations. Um, but one thing that was really interesting in writing this article and publishing it was that I started getting back mail from all over the country. You know, a mom in Ann Arbor who said, you didn't report this about Ann Arbor, but this is exactly what my life is right now. Or I've been saying this to all of my friends in Portland for months, but nobody would listen. Um, so to me, that suggests that even if this isn't a huge population of people, that there are pockets of the country where people tend to be very, very progressive, where this is a line of conflict, and it's something that people recognize and resonate with. The story kind of brought up some feelings for me around the fact that, like, you know, we have this great rollout of vaccines happening, but we still only got about 30 percent of the population vaccinated. And that varies pretty widely from county to county, from state to state. Um, and there's a lot of things where there's stuff that would be fine if you were vaccinated. That's not fine if you're not vaccinated. There's still like a lot of people that aren't vaccinated. So how do we, like, as a cultural zeitgeist, it, it just made me sort of wonder, like, as a cultural zeitgeist issue, you know, this pocket of people, you know, how do we know that they're not actually following the science? They just aren't vaccinated yet. Yeah. So I would divide this into two categories, um, which I think is really important. 
the policy questions and the personal behavior questions. So on the policy questions front, I looked, as you said, at schools and the resistance to school reopening, which I think in a lot of places had more to do with the kind of local politics scene. For example, in Somerville, there was a lot of resistance from the local teachers union, which really delayed the opening. Um, or, for example, you know, one of the, the things I, I write about briefly in there is um, California, the state of California, keeping playgrounds closed until early December of last year. This was far after we knew that surface transmission was not a big driver of, of COVID and that actually being outside is one of the safest ways that you can engage with other people. You know, it seems silly to nitpick about playground openings, but It's really big for families whose kids are maybe stuck doing Zoom school the rest of the week to be able to get out and and give them somewhere to go. Um, So, you know, the policy questions, I think, are, are one bucket where you saw some state and local leaders pursuing policies that didn't really keep up with where scientific evidence was pointing around smart risks. Um, And the second category, which I think you're right, is maybe harder to navigate because it's so personal, is people's personal behaviors. Um, You know, there's been a lot of talk about like the COVID school moms who spend a lot of time like frowning at people who don't wear a mask when they're biking or, you know, Twitter shaming people for being out traveling or whatever it might be. Um, I think these cultures of collective responsibility for other people's safety, which is what you were talking about, Nate, a little bit earlier. Um, I think that's really core here to understanding the specific subculture that I'm looking at. Um, You know, people whose politics are very much animated by a sense that we have a collective responsibility to end climate change and to face economic inequality and that big systemic problems are a part of our everyday life. I think that kind of ethic, that willingness to really sacrifice in order to help other people, translates over, in this case sometimes, to behaviors or restrictions that um, don't necessarily accord with where things at. Um, So I would give, again, the example of outdoor gatherings. Um, You know, people really laying into wanting to maintain outdoor distance mass gatherings, even in areas where people are very highly vaccinated or where they and the, their friends would be vaccinated when they're having those gatherings. You know, this just doesn't keep up with where we know the science is around what's safe. Do we know that a lot of that is happening? Let me introduce one uh, piece of data where I think liberals are wrong, more or less, or at least a majority of them are wrong. Um, So YouGov asked a question last month um, asking people about how worried are you personally about experiencing COVID-19? So it's not risk to society, it's just their personal risk. Um, And they break it down both by partisanship and by vaccination status. So among Biden voters, 67% of Biden voters who have been vaccinated say they're somewhat or very worried still about catching COVID. Um, Whereas conversely, if you look among, let's see, Trump voters here, not as many Trump voters are vaccinated, but of those that are, 27% of those who've been vaccinated say they're still very or somewhat worried about catching COVID. Um, I think that, you know, this is something where obviously your kind of feeling of safety is one thing, but like more or less when you're vaccinated, you should not be that worried, I don't think, about catching COVID, right? There's also data, if you ask liberals kind of what is the rate of COVID hospitalizations, they way, way overestimate it. Conservatives actually overestimate to a small degree, but liberals to do to a much greater degree. Um, so there's there's that, but also like, I don't know, I would probably take issue with the whole notion about, uh, oh, follow the science, right? Um, because the science can tell you, for example, that like doing something outdoors is 20% safer or whatever the number is and doing the same activity indoors, right? Um, it can't tell you if the outdoor activity is worth it to you or the indoor activity is worth it to you relative to the amount of pleasure or whatever else that you derive from that potentially, you know, and that's actually a case where the science is like unusually clear cut, I think outdoors versus indoors, right? I remember doing a little bit of travel, like um, travel to like the Carolinas in January. Right. And like my partner and I were like, kind of, we felt like we were kind of freaks for like wanting to eat outdoors when everyone else was indoors. And we're like, it's 20 times safer. That's a lot. Right. But, you know, but then there are things that are a lot more difficult. Like, how do you measure the value of, like, um, 
not seeing in person family or friends for an extended period of time, right? That's a much more difficult kind of call, I think, to make than whether you're doing the same activity indoors or outdoors or, or you know, how much would you sacrifice to avoid kind of having to live in, in lockdown for some period of time? Um, so in some sense, one thing I think that maybe not like Trumpian, <laughs> well, certainly not like anti-vax conservatives are right about, but I think like maybe center right or center left people are correct about is that we do have to think about like trade-offs here, right? Um, and that, you know, whether to keep society open is not purely or even primarily a scientific question. It's a political question, um, first and foremost, that requires input from epidemiology, but also would require input from other types of sciences, sociology and, and economics and everything else, right? Um, and that kind of following the science doesn't necessarily get you very far as far as how to like live your life or how society should collectively abide by certain rules and restrictions. You know, on the flip side, um, as you're saying, Nate, there are probably situations where for certain people's lives, risks that other people wouldn't take are worth it to them because it means something for them personally. But, you know, I do want to say this piece that I was writing was talking about people who are sort of overextending restrictions. But I want to give credit to the kind of opposite side of that argument, which is for some people, the trauma of COVID, personal losses that they've experienced, personal kind of fear that they feel, um, whatever it might be contextually, could mean that for them, it actually is worth it to take less risk. So they see more of a gain in their mental health, their personal well-being by feeling like they're being overcautious than they do by, you know, meeting some friends at a bar because they're vaccinated. Um, so, you know, I want I want to give credit to that, that um, science is not a, a sort of like textbook that's handed down on high that gives us a clear set of rules for how we live our life. It's, you know, a push pull of understanding of facts um, that is constantly in flux that emerges through consensus over time that is often very messy to interpret. Um, so I just I just wanted to sort of add that in. I think like this is something we've been talking about like all year long, right? The idea that I mean, since the beginning, we've kind of wanted there to be a set of rules that you could feel comfortable like knowing I am doing the right thing, and there never was. There was always just like here's some here's some general vague risk principles that you can kind of follow. And then we sort of like toss those things out there. And most Americans were sort of left to kind of figure out what that meant for your personal life. And you got like really, you know, to, to Nate's point, it felt like, I think, really mixed messages that you were beginning all year long, because you have what's coming from scientists versus what's coming from politicians that are going through a lot of other different directions that they're pulling information from. And like, that's still going on, right? Like we have situations right now where I'm, <laughs> I'm every day on the phone with researchers who like have repeatedly told me that we shouldn't be having kids indoor sports because there are out these outbreaks that are spreading through that. And like, that's the main thing that's spreading COVID through schools right now. And then I'm here in my very liberal town where there is kids indoor sports happening in the entire school district. And like that feels, I think that feels contradictory for, to people. And I'm wondering sort of like how you factor in that, that sense of like, who do I trust? How, am, why am I getting mixed messages from different sides? How does that sort of factor in into like how people are making these decisions? Because it seems to me like that, you know, talking to like anecdotally, talking to people in my bubble, in my community, um, that that seems to really play a huge role in when people aren't taking their masks off outside, what's driving it. You know, one of the things I was struck by in my reporting was hearing from people who are very progressive, who seem to have lost trust in the CDC or to at least have found reason to be skeptical of it. And I think part of that is because they perceived that during the Trump administration, the CDC was politicized and wasn't able to give straightforward advice um, in a you know scientifically supported way. And to me, that's a really interesting thing to sit with because when we stereotype the left, we think, oh, you know, people who are very comfortable with um, scientific 
expertise, authority, in fact, really um, sort of bring that into an identity, right? Like these stereotypical lawn signs where it says, in this house, we believe, you know, yada, 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 you know, science is real. Um, so it's a matter of identity. Um, and, you know, a, 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 a widespread sense that our institutions have failed us and that we can't trust them and we don't exactly know who to listen to. I think is one of the reasons why within some of these liberal communities, progressive communities that I was looking at, um, at least within some subset, there's a kind of, um, as you were saying earlier, Maggie, the, the instinct to go along with your tribe, right? The instinct to kind of follow and say, well, none of my friends are meeting up with people indoors, so I don't think we should do it yet. Or, you know, everyone on my block in New York City wears masks outside, so clearly that must be what the safe thing is to do. Um, and it, I think that absence of, of some clear messaging to really let people trust and move forward is definitely a huge part of this. I want to dig into a little bit more of the why behind how perceptions of COVID have become more partisan and also what the ramifications are. We mentioned some of this data in passing, but I want to you know cite the specifics just to emphasize it. A study from Gallup last December showed that Democrats dramatically overestimate the severity of coronavirus. 40% believed that half of people with COVID are hospitalized. The real number is between 1% and 5%. Likewise, 40% of Republicans believed that COVID was less deadly than automobile accidents and the flu. That's also dramatically misunderstanding the severity of COVID. So we started to get into the why behind of that. We started to get into the why behind this. Can we talk a little bit more about, so people don't trust institutions. I think that probably exists on both sides of the political spectrum. How, do, you know, from that point, how did Democrats get driven into, you know, to some extent, at least some Democrats get driven into this place where they feel like they have to be taking extra precautions above and beyond what the CDC says or what the science says, and Republicans basically ignoring the severity of the disease. Is it political elites? Is it media? What's going on here? I think Trump is the huge elephant in the room here. I was talking with um, a doctor named Monica Gandhi, who's very progressive, but has become a little bit of a gadfly. Um, She's at UCSF, but she's really taken a pretty strong stance against a kind of zero risk mentality around COVID. And something she was saying to me that she observed in her own community medically and within the broader community of San Francisco was this feeling like if Trump is going to keep get schools back open, by golly, we're going to keep schools closed. Like anything Trump does, we do the equal and opposite of it. And she has come to feel that some of that has become a little knee jerk. Um, and especially as we've changed very much in the situation of the virus with the rollout of vaccines and with the Biden administration and the way that it's handling COVID, um, I think that kind of leftover mentality can sometimes be a little bit of a, a detraction. Yeah, I think I think Trump is part of it. I think the media is part of it too, like on that hospitalization number, for example. You know, initial estimates of what percentage of people who get COVID get hospitalized were on the order of anywhere from like 5% to 20%. And now it seems like it's more like 1% or 2%, maybe a little higher depending on how you count, right? Um, That was not widely reported. I'm kind of obsessed with like predictions and models for obvious reasons. So I track this stuff, right? But like there wasn't like a big round of media kind of like mea culpas on, oh, actually we overestimated the hospitalization rate. And that's actually nice because it means that we're less likely to have hospitals go over capacity. Then he also impacted like when Governor Cuomo, for example, um, very dumbly in retrospect, told COVID patients to go back to their nursing homes, right? That was partly out of concern that hospitals are going to be completely overwhelmed based on projection models. And therefore, it's terrible. You have to triage the situation, right? So I think there are, you know, kind of if it bleeds, it leads is kind of one <laughs> one phrase, right? There were a lot of stories about um about, you know, a potential fourth wave or whatever in New York City where I live, right, which never really materialized. And then kind of grudgingly two days ago, the New York Times did a story saying, oh, we're starting to see a little bit of a decline in the city. Cases are down like 60 or 70 percent over the past three or four weeks. It's like not like a little decline. It's very significant, right? Um, So I think there are biases in kind of the way different stories are presented. Um, But also like, you know, we are not Monica Gandhi is an exception, right? Or Julia Marcus is another one. Um, We are not having a lot of adult conversations about risk, right? Um, 
that actually it's very costly to like isolate yourself socially for months at a time or a year and a half now almost for some people, right? It's very costly for kids not to attend school in person. Um, and if those costs are aggregated over 330 million people, then like, there's a huge loss of of welfare, and then since an economist would use that term, right? Um, and the notion of, oh, it's kind of COVID versus the economy. I mean, the economy, who fucking cares about the economy for the economy's sake, right? It's about kind of people's well-being, and if people are isolated, they're much less happy and kind of not enjoying many of the things that makes kind of life worth living, potentially, right? And so it's like not that like we're going to be able to achieve zero risk so much as like as like you want a low enough risk where it's hugely beneficial for many reasons to be able to kind of have, you know, 90% of your normal life back. And I think we don't necessarily talk about that in those terms enough. I wonder if there's also like a layer where things that are not necessarily like political connections and shared interests that are not necessarily having to be tied to COVID are getting tied into COVID and sort of reinforcing this. Because I thought, I think a little bit about like the, what struck me when I was reading your story was that the issue in Somerville wasn't really between liberal parents and more liberal parents, it was between parents and the teachers union. And when I looked at like some of these, I think same thing happened in Chicago, right? Like that wasn't really between parents and parents, that was between the t- city and the teachers union. And the, I kind of was like looking at these, these maps of like the places where there are smaller proportions of schools that were back in, you know, in-person learning. And it just made me wonder, like, are those just correlated with the states that have stronger teachers unions? And those teachers are thinking about their self-interest as being the people that are exposed to this population that's not going to be vaccinated for a long time and dealing with things that way. But if they in the states where they have more power, they have more power. And in those, st- those same states also happen to be states where supporting the teachers union is a liberal value. Yeah, you know, Somerville is a really interesting example. And I think I could have, you know, spent six months trying to actually unpack all the politics in Somerville, because there's actually quite a lot going on there. The teachers union is one factor, but it's also a strong mayor city. So the mayor's office has a lot of control over schools. And there actually aren't as many kids in Somerville as there are in some of the surrounding cities. So parents are a relatively weak constituency. Um, So all of this sort of comes together along with the teachers union problem, along or, you know, the factor of the teachers union, um, and along with um, sort of attitudes around wanting to really perform that they had gone to every length and done every assessment possible. They put together these documents that had such extensive changes, like, for example, overhauling all of the toilet flushers to become automatic toilet flushers, right? They put together a budget that was like $7.5 million, and it's actually only a handful of schools. And so to me, what this reveals is that there's a lot of politics going on in the background that didn't really have that much to do with the evidence on whether it was safe to get kids back in classroom with certain mitigations. It had to do with the temperature in the town, the predilections of the mayor's office, the teachers union. Um, And I, I think that's a really important lesson because, you know, there's a temptation, I think, to sometimes say on the left, um, you know, oh, we follow the science, like we're Democrats, we're the party of science, whatever. And, and I think it's it's become really clear through my reporting that, you know, there's a lot of politics and personal taste and, you know, posturing that gets mixed in. And it's not always necessarily that the evidence on what's safe is winning out. One thing that this made me think of, I think during the past year, we have tried to draw parallels between COVID and other challenges that society faces, like climate change, for example. And one thing that we've seen over time is a big divergence between Democrats and Republicans on the question of whether or not humans are a prime factor in, you know, creating climate change. That's, I think, where this identity comes from of, I'm a Democrat, I believe in science, Republicans don't believe in science. When really, the evidence, the research shows that people don't read the science themselves and come to conclusions based on what the evidence says. They follow what political elites say. And so because Republican-aligned media and Republican elites will say, you know, humans are not the biggest factor, look at China, maybe this isn't real after all, etc., Republicans will believe that. And then Democrats 
are likewise like not necessarily reading through all of the science, but uh, you know adopting the views of po- their own political elites and media and so on. So is this kind of just what's happened here to some extent? Like, are people digging into the research, figuring out what they think is a big risk, what isn't a big risk, and then acting accordingly? Or are they just adopting the posture of whatever political elites or media exist in their sphere? Should we expect think, them to do that? <laughs> I think, I mean, I'm a weirdo because I, like, I know lots of friends who like kind of in some sense or another are trying to like evaluate risk for a living, like poker players or investors and people like that, right? We should mention one thing here, which is that like um, the single worst sin of not following the science in COVID today is anti-vaccination propaganda. And that's mostly concentrated on the right. And that's worse than I think anything else that we're talking about today. So, um, so yeah, but look, I think people and wait, like- And hold on, can I just pause you there to reiterate that like I said at the beginning that yeah. I don't think you can necessarily draw equivalencies between kind of early rejection of mitigation uh, efforts, rejecting masking indoors, things like that, and where we are today and how certain pockets of liberal Americans feel about this. And like, obviously the consequences of those two behaviors are very different. We had the former conversation a lot on this podcast. So that is why we're focusing a little bit on the latter conversation. But I appreciate you emphasizing again that, you know, there's a complicated conversation and we're, we're picking at pieces of it. Yeah, what, what Tucker Carlson does on his nightly show is worse than anything else we're talking about in this episode, right? Let's just make that clear. Um, but, you know, but yeah, I mean, sometimes I'll kind of say something on Twitter that implies that um, people might be slightly irrational um, and people kind of get up in arms by that. Most people aren't rational (laughs) (laughs) most of the time. I'm probably not rational most of the time either. Right. Um, People are kind of predictably irrational to steal the title of a, of a good book. And so, you know, it takes kind of work sometimes to like, to tell yourself when you get vaccinated that, okay, a 95% reduction in getting symptomatic COVID that's a 20 fold reduction. That's, that's really big. That's like, not like, um, just around the margin, right? That's really big. And like, I had a setting today in, um, I was leaving my apartment to go running. Right. And there were people that got on, um, in the elevator, um, and weren't wearing masks. Right. And like, you know, literally I had yelled at neighbors about this back when, when really bad COVID spread in New York before anyone was vaccinated. Right. And it's kind of like, you know, I don't think I have to worry about like seven seconds on an elevator as a vaccinated person with an unmasked person. It's just kind of nice to like not have to worry about it so much, but you get so many habits that are like ingrained for so many months. I'm like very empathetic to people who, um, who kind of still are exhibiting a lot of caution. It's rational. Mm-hmm. People are not all that rational. Well, I don't think like anybody is necessarily rational, right? Like you said, like it, it's, it's a thing where what I have seen is people like my, my liberal friends, colleagues making these decisions in ways that are trying to sort of evaluate risk, but sort of understanding that they don't, they don't have the skills to do that. They're not going to pick that up right now. So they're using a whole bunch of other things. I mean, I think it is a, I think it's like a fallacy of, (laughs) it's a fallacy of American culture to expect people to be rational and to judge each other when we aren't and look at that as like the ideal way to be because I'm not even sure it actually is. On the other hand, I was just going to add, um, sort of cutting in the opposite direction, I do think that with a certain subset of progressives who tend to be pretty highly educated, um, one of the things I was talking about with a mom in Somerville who's a child psychiatrist was her experience you know, advocating about schools, talking to community members, trying to understand where people were at. And she drew a parallel to the anti-vax debate and said that there had been a similar effect with COVID, which is the inappropriate democratization of science. This idea that really educated people, if you're just, you know, a layperson, you can pull a preprint from Science magazine um, or the journal Science and, um, you know, understand exactly what that means and how it should be framed in context. And she feels like she's run into a lot of people who just don't understand the medical context of what they're looking at. So I, I do think that there's the kind of opposite thing, which is, yeah, a lot of people are going on gut instinct, but it's gut instinct that maybe has this haze of sciencyness or this haze of authoritiness, which isn't necessarily coming from a place that's hyper-informed. So I guess, you know, one question I have 
in all of this is, you know, that framing of like, either I believe the science and you don't believe the science or whatever. Does the science tell us which approach to the pandemic is right or wrong? Like in in a way, I know that there are many different pieces of like, this behavior is better than that behavior is more risky than the other behavior. But like, if you're saying, I believe in science, I trust the science, is there always going to be a right answer for what kinds of policies or behaviors to follow? Depends on where on the scale you're talking about. Like, I mean, there are some things that are going to be absolutely wrong, right? Like if you're injecting bleach into your veins and refusing to wear a mask in a crowded theater of unvaccinated people, yeah, like that's probably the wrong approach. You know, like if you were running around during the lockdown period last spring when we really knew very little and just, you know, having porch parties then, that was probably also the wrong approach. But there's a huge, big gray area in the middle that, like, data can't necessarily tell you what you're supposed to do. Um, And this is actually, like, this is one of the things I've been sort of thinking about with, like, another knee-jerk political thing that's happened because of this partisanship is that, like, right now there's, um, there's a whole bunch of bills before state legislatures that are aimed at, at, from conservative groups, aimed at taking power away from... Um, governors and public health boards and cities in the context of, you know, public health emergencies and putting it into the hands of state legislatures and elected officials. And that's one of those situations where that really shifts the balance of what is being looked at in some cases. Like if you're taking power from a public health board and getting it to an elected official that's a big shift in what those people are looking at and what kinds of decisions they're going to make and how they're going to balance the balance like science and other factors in that muddy middle situation. Maggie, you raised one other thing which might seem like a little bit of tension, but I think it's important, right? But talking about that like initial period, March, April, May of last year, we didn't know very much, right? right. Um, you know, I think part of the problem is like, there are a lot of paths where the initial step should be to have a pretty strict lockdown, right? Yep. Um, and by the way, some countries, you know, China did, at least if you believe their official data, contain COVID. South Korea contained COVID after initial outbreak. Australia has contained COVID, right? In Europe and the Americas, very few places have contained COVID. Certainly the U.S. has not, right? Um, but, you know, but when we didn't know very much, we were learning more about how COVID is transmitted, right? Um then it may have made sense just to like literally kind of gather more data, um, more information, right? I wish we had used that time more productively um, to like, for example, fund better testing regimes, for instance, which took a long time to get up to speed. Um, But no one really had a great plan B. We were kind of, I think, often defaulting to lockdowns as here is our mitigation measure when it's a very cumbersome mitigation measure in some ways. And the countries that have beaten COVID have found... um, some way to avoid lockdowns. But in general too, like, you know, one thing I noticed is they'll be making decisions that are based on what the science was understood to be as of a few months ago, right? So at first there was questions about like, um, do you have medium to long-term immunity from having had caught COVID, right? And the answer now seems to be for probably 80 or 90% of people, maybe more, there's pretty decent medium-term immunity. We don't know enough about the long-term yet because the long-term hasn't literally existed for more than a year yet, right? Um, But like it took a long time for that to like filter into kind of what the average New York Times or NPR listening liberal reader thought because at first people were saying scientists don't know. It takes some time to like to unwind um, people's perceptions. And like to Emma, I was reading kind of some of the feedback you're getting on your piece um, in preparation for this and like some bit friendly, some less friendly, but like you also had liberals who were saying kind of like, um, well, I don't trust the CDC because they screwed up on this or that. Therefore, I don't trust the CDC when they say it's safe to do these things after a vaccine, right? It's just another thing the CDC is going to get wrong. And so people have like a lot of um, trust that was kind of very broken um, in institutions, in media, Um, anxiety of waiting for the other shoe to drop you know like I think this entire year has been that yep yeah I'm 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 deeply empathetic to that I mean I think 
it's a lot to come out of a collective trauma and especially for people who have had personal losses, lost their job, you know, had to have their kids around, wrecking up their house for a year, people who have died. Like these are really, really serious traumas. And I, I don't take that lightly. Um, but I, I have also been kind of struck in the replies, you know, on Twitter, or, you know, the hate mail that I've gotten or whatever, part of the fun of being a journalist. Um, a lot of people start their responses with something like, you know, um, I don't care what the CDC says, like my kids are going to be inside with me until there's a full vaccine for them and they're not going to see anyone or do anything. Or, you know, I don't care. I'm going to keep wearing a mask, you know, on and on and on because like I don't know who's not vaccinated. And, um, you know, to a certain extent, you can understand where some of these motivations are coming from. But again, I think it comes back to a kind of risk misapprehension and inability to kind of conceive of risks. Um, and it, I think what's interesting to me is is less trying to make fun of people for that or shame people for that, but sh- just seeing how personal it gets, like how emotional. Um, there was a, one little piece in my piece about um, Emily Oster, who's an economist at Brown, who wrote a piece for The Atlantic that was about basically like, you know, it's safe to take kids on trips this summer to like go see your family. And she got an email back literally to the provost at Brown and her department chair, everybody who's her boss, saying you should promote her to lead in the emerging field of genocide encouragement. Um, And, you know, that kind of hate mail, obviously there are like crazy people everywhere who will say anything, but it, it felt to me like that emotional, that level of emotion, right, was really speaking to something deeper, which is it's not just that people misapprehend the risk, it's that they're really attached to a risk-averse mindset and kind of see it as the only way to be a good citizen. So what we've laid out here is a really complicated situation where partisanship has in many ways acted as a vehicle for risk assessment and decision-making over the past year plus. This pandemic has been, there's been a lot of unknowns and it's been kind of scary and a lot for a lot of countries. But as I mentioned at the beginning, the United States is unique in just how partisan, perhaps, it became. And I know that there have been protests in other countries as well and so on. But at least from the study that Pew looked at, we're really divided. And almost living in, you know, as some of the studies showed how the different members of different parties are perceiving risk differently, almost living in different realities. So what have, you know, to wrap this conversation up today, what have you all learned about the country politically, socially, culturally from the past year plus? And, and what have you learned about how we might deal with crises in the future? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Should we just leave it with a chuckle and end the show there? Rueful chuckle music. You know, somebody asked me um, in the course of writing and publishing this piece, like, is there a way that we could have had a pandemic play out without political identity getting involved. And I was like, no, (laughs) we live in the United States of America. Partisan identity, as a lot of political scientists have been showing, um, is much, much, much deeper than just who people vote for and what policies they support. It's, you know, what car do they drive? It's what kind of television do they watch? It's like how they're thinking about big questions of education and personal interaction. Um, These are really, really deep cultural signifiers. And so, of course, they conditioned the way that we responded to the pandemic. Um, But, you know, at the same time, I, as a reporter, am, you know, keeping my eye on questions ahead around how deep the political wounds of the pandemic are going to be. I had a conversation in the course of reporting my article with this guy who is a progressive, you know, political PR guy in Boston. He worked on Ayanna Presley's campaign in 2018. And he was saying, you know, basically to me, it comes down to this, like the pandemic has showed who in America is willing to make a sacrifice to protect other people and who's not, who's selfish and who's willing to, to help others. And if that's your mindset, you can see why you would have want to play with people who have the opposite point of view, right? There's no such thing as bipartisanship when you literally want to kill people or don't care if people die. Um, So, you know, I think that's a question to watch is whether the pandemic sort of further entrenches these attitudes that people have on both sides of the political aisle. I mean, I still in some sense am 
I can imagine a world in which um, things got coded the opposite way and that conservatives were more kind of pro restrictions and lockdowns and liberals were um, for some of the you know, reasons being like historically conservatives kind of have more, you know, if you look at the psychology of voters and some of the status, I think kind of mediocre, but like it was just they're more concerned about outside threats. They want more um, protection, right? That's kind of the classic archetype, but also like the institutions that were most impacted by lockdowns are things like schools, but also, you know, but also the arts. It's like kind of not domestic life is affected less than like urban life and restaurants and cultural amenities and all this stuff, right? Um, and these are supposed to be things that like liberals <laughs> value a lot and why people pay a lot to live in kind of tiny apartments in big cities. Um, also, we haven't talked much about the fact that like only 40 or 50% of jobs can be performed from home. Um, and people aren't just kind of working from home or living at home. They're kind of working from home, but having like people who are probably poor, often non-white, deliver them food and goods on demand, basically, right? And so there's kind of inequality perpetuated by um, by like lockdowns too. And so COVID's a particularly kind of tricky issue where like um, where the trade-offs to sacrificing, um, you know, civic life and school and political participation in church. I mean, like, you know, I, I think um, the notion of what kind of liberals decide to find as essential is too narrow, <laughs> right? And kind of having like kind of a liberal outlook on society and kind of believing in society means we should have like a broader view of like companionship is essential. Political expression is essential. Religious expression, if you're religious, is essential. Education is essential, right? And like we should be preaching a large circle of things as not being optional, right? Um, but, you know, I don't know. But it's complicated. It's traumatic. It's something none of us, unless you're old enough to have lived through the, you know, uh, 1919 pandemic. So, yeah. I got to give, I'm going to give Maggie the last word just because I know Emma has to go. Um, I think like one of the things that I have learned is how reactive this has made politics, uh, how reactive partisanship has made politics. Because you had like, you had liberals reacting liberal governors reacting to Trump, you had Trump reacting to liberal governors, you had the, you know, to the extent that there is a political force of people expressing over caution now, like that's reacting to what happened earlier when there were people in power who were un, who were less cautious than they should have been. Um, you have people reacting to them with these laws that are going to change the way that we respond to, you know, to future pandemics, to future disasters for years. And nobody is really necessarily being proactive. And I think that that is where we start to like kind of really have some problems is that if everything is reactive, we're not actually solving the problems where patching over the last thing we didn't like which doesn't necessarily move us forward. All right. Well, a thoughtful, if slightly depressing note to end on, but thank you everyone so much for this conversation today. It was um, informing to listen to and, and very interesting. So thank you, Emma, Nate, and Maggie. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Maggie. A note before we go, I'm going to be out next week. And so someone will be filling in for me on Monday. And then on Thursday, we're going to have an episode of the podcast series, Lady Bird Johnson in plain sight in this podcast feed. I hope people check it out and also subscribe to the series wherever they get their podcasts. That's it for now. My name is Galen Druk. Anna Rothschild is in the virtual control room. Claire Bidigary Curtis is on audio editing. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>